do you want to learn to play claustrophobia 1643? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this game, and if you stay tuned to the end, hopefully you can pick up some tips and strategies along the way. Coming up. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Italy University, bringing you a variety of quality board game videos. On this channel, we do a lot of overview, review, playthrough, vlog, and how to play, just like this one. So, if you're new here, please consider subscribing and do hit the bell to be notified of when we post new videos. Now, let's get to the rules of Claustrophobia 1643, game by Croft and Lauren Porchain, published by Monolith. Claustrophobia 1643 is a tactical two-player combat and dungeon crawling game set in 17th century Europe. In the game, one player takes the roles of a human faction, while the other takes the roles of the infernal faction, comprising troglodytes, hellhounds, and some terrifying demons. Through the game, the human player will explore the catacombs, and the human and infernal players will battle each other for supremacy. The game is scenario driven. In each scenario, the human player will attempt to meet that scenario's objective, while the infernal player will try to stop the humans and kill them off. Whichever player meets his or her objective first wins the game. A couple of things to note before we begin. Claustrophobia 1643 is a scenario driven game and comes with a book of many scenarios. Each scenario has different setup instructions as well as different victory conditions and rules. And in this video, we'll use examples from a number of different scenarios. All of the scenarios are standalone, and all of the information specific to the scenario is public knowledge at the start of the game. So nothing that we're telling you here would be considered a spoiler. Additionally, we're only showing you the scenarios that come with the base 2019 Kickstarter release of Claustrophobia, and I'll be making some generalizations about these scenarios. Some of these generalizations may not hold for future expansions of the game. To set up a scenario, choose a human player and an infernal player, and then each of those players gathers his or her components. These will be specific to the scenario. The human player takes a character sheet corresponding to each of the characters required in the scenario, then slots each into one of the character boards. Take the mini associated with each of the characters. The minis will closely resemble the pictures on the character sheets, and this is important for distinguishing between characters with the same name. The scenario may call for some characters to start with gifts, represented by these tokens, or equipment, which are shown on these cards. Gift tokens are placed in this slot on the appropriately numbered row and any equipment items are placed under the character board of the character holding it. The human player shuffles up the instinct cards, which are shown in white, and keeps them nearby. If the scenario calls for the player to start with instinct cards, these go into the player's hand. At this point, they're not associated with any specific character. Finally, the player takes the white activation dice. The infernal player will also gather his or her characters, which will include one or more unique demons, may include some hellhounds, and will include a number of troglodytes. The large board will hold the troglodytes. The two small boards with only three holes down the bottom will be the ones that accommodate any hellhounds, and the other boards with many more holes down the bottom accommodate the demons. Once again, take all of the matching minis ready for use. Shuffle up all of the black event cards and keep them close by as those are used only by the infernal player. Likewise, take all the prima materia crystals and take an amount, putting them down to here, based on what the scenario says is your starting quantity. In the scenario we saw before, the player starts with four of these crystals. Finally, take the six destiny dice and place them here. Take any other components from the box matching what's shown in your scenario. Here the scenario requires a direction and turn marker token, and here it requires these equipment cards and these tokens. Leftover tokens and equipment cards in most cases can be removed from the game, although keep the exhaustion markers and a few of these ones around as they're going to help you during the game. 
Next, you'll set up your tiles from the game using the instructions given in Scenario Setup. This will usually involve picking out specific tiles relevant to your scenario and then layering them through a stack of tiles you can explore. The number in the red box is used as a reference in these instructions. So in your first scenario you'll just be picking out two tiles and then shuffling the rest into a big stack. While others will include much more detailed layering instructions to do before you can begin. Ensure all players have read and understood the victory conditions and any special rules that relate to this scenario. You're now ready to play. Claustrophobia is played in rounds, and in each round, both the human player and the infernal player will have a chance to take actions in the catacombs. Each round begins with the human preparation phase, in which the human rolls dice, then allocates one die to each of his or her heroes, therefore choosing which of the six lines on that hero will be activated during the round. These lines will represent the battle stats for those heroes. Then the player may move and take an action with each of his or her pieces. This will largely involve moving, attacking enemies, and taking actions specific to the scenario. Next follows the Infernal Player's Preparation Phase, in which that player rolls three of his or her dice, and then allocates them among the various powers on his or her destiny board. The player may trigger any or all of these that have collected enough dice in order to take their abilities for this round. Then follows the Threat Phase, in which the Infernal Player can bring new demons and enemies into play, by spending threat points that he or she has collected. Then finally, as for the human player, the infernal player may move and take an action with each of his or her figures. And this will usually involve attacking the human players and attempting to do them harm. Once the infernal player has moved and taken actions with all figures, then a new round begins and play passes back to the human player. Play continues back and forth in this manner until one player has won the game. Remember that the human player's objective is determined by the scenario, while the infernal player, in pretty much all cases, is trying to wipe the human player out before that objective is achieved. To start the human preparation phase, the human player gathers up all of his or her activation dice, there should be one per character shakes them and then rolls them. Each will show a number between 1 and 6. The player then allocates these dice onto each of his or her characters, such that each character has one die which is located in the row whose number matches the die. The line which has been activated for a specific character tells you that character's battle statistics until the next round. So for example, in this round the Condemned Brute will have one movement point, three attack points, and four defense. Additionally, at the same time as placing these dice, the player may play up to one instinct card from his or her hand onto each of his or her characters. This can be played in one of two ways, either with the text at the top, in which case that character will gain the text bonus shown for this round. Alternatively, the card can be flipped with the number side up and this allows the player to change that die on that character to match that number. A single character cannot have more than one instinct card played per round, and this will be discarded at the start of the next preparation phase. After allocating dice and instinct cards, then look at the final column to do gifts and bonuses. If the Redeemer character has activated a line showing a gift, then the player will either have that gift throughout the rest of this round, or, if it has an immediate action, activates that now. The Aura of Courage, for example, would allow the player to boost the statistics of one of the other characters for the rest of this round. Then, if the line of activation for any character shows the Instinct icon, the player draws one new Instinct card into his or her hand. Once again, this card belongs to the player. Until it is played, it doesn't belong to any character in particular. A player's maximum hand of instinct cards is equal to the number of characters that he or she commands. And because these bonuses are gained after allocating the dice, 
Any cards you draw cannot be played on characters until a subsequent round. As the game goes on, the player will take damage, and every time the player is damaged, a damage marker is placed into one of these spaces. Any line containing a damage marker is called a cancelled line of activation. If the player elects to activate a cancelled line of activation, then take one of the exhaustion markers, which looks like this, and place it over the top of the statistics. Instead of what's printed, the player will have the exhaustion statistics. No movement, no attack, and the lowest possible 3 defense, as well as having no gift. The player cannot gain the benefit of equipment cards when using an exhausted line, unless the card specifically says you can. However, it is possible to boost an exhausted player's statistics for the round by using the effects from another character. If an effect heals that line of activation during your turn, then the exhaustion marker is also removed and you gain back your battle statistics. If your activated line is damaged during a turn, you still retain these statistics. The exhaustion marker is placed only if you choose a cancelled line of activation during preparation not if it's cancelled during the round. If all six of a player's lines of activation are cancelled, then that character is killed and removed from the game. In the human activation phase, the human player has the opportunity to activate each of his or her characters. When activating a character, that character may take a movement and take an action. This can be done in either order. The character could move, and then take an action, or take an action, and then move. Both movement and action are optional, so a character could move without acting, or act without moving. What a character cannot do is move or act more than once. This is true even if the character still has movement points left. A character with two movement points could not move one step, act, and then move again. Additionally, a character must be fully activated before another character can be activated. So this character could not act, followed by movement here, and then action again later. Now, although I talk about action, in the game, there's only really one basic action, and that is to engage in combat. Some equipment items have an action keyword, but again, all of these are engaging in a form of combat. The only other type of action available will be specific to each scenario. These special actions are described in the scenario booklet, and they're usually critical for the human player to complete the scenario. So now, let's look at how movement and combat work. A character has movement points equal to the number shown next to the four-way arrow in his or her current line of activation. In this case, the Condemned Scout has two movement points. This means that that condemned scout could move a distance of up to two tiles through open pathways. All pathways will follow an orthogonal route, and in some locations you'll find a black coloured dead end through which a character cannot move. There are two key restrictions when moving around revealed tiles on the board. The first is the tile's occupancy limit, which is this number shown in three of the four corners of the tile. A player may not have more of his or her figures in that tile than the occupancy number states. And so while the human player could place three figures into this particular tile, another figure could not be sent to join this scout because the occupancy limit here is 1. The occupancy limit is counted separately for each player. So this tile with an occupancy limit of 1 can hold one human character and one infernal character but could not hold two Infernal Warriors, even if the human character was removed. Secondly, a warrior cannot leave a tile if its faction is outnumbered by the other faction. Here there are three Infernal Warriors to one human, and therefore, while two of these Infernal Warriors could leave, the human warrior could not. This also counts for moving through a tile, so with two movement points, this warrior could not move through, because leaving this tile would be outnumbered. Players can try to manage this restriction carefully. For example, a third warrior could now pass through here with two movement points, because when leaving this tile would not be outnumbered. However, these two would still be frozen there, until they can defeat or remove at least one of those other infernal enemies. There are two warrior traits which break the blocking rule. A warrior with the elusive trait, 
represented by this flying boot, can leave a tile even if outnumbered. While if a warrior has the impressive trait, represented by this big man little man icon, then opposing warriors cannot leave the tile even if they outnumber the impressive warrior. So in this case, the human warriors cannot leave the impressive scourge, and the scourge cannot leave because it's outnumbered. In this scenario, a fight to the death is likely to ensue. Where an elusive warrior faces an impressive one, the two powers cancel out, and you resolve whether or not you can leave by the normal rules. The other thing the human player may do when moving is explore an unexplored exit. To do this, the top tile is drawn from the stack of tiles that was prepared in setup. Then the infernal player gets to look at this tile and choose its orientation at that entrance. So the player may try to set up dead ends so that the character has to backtrack into awaiting enemies. The infernal player must make the tile enterable, in other words could not place it this way to dead end it right at the start. Once the tile is placed, the human player finishes that movement point by moving the warrior into that tile. Then check to see if there's a circular icon in the corner of the tile. There are a variety of different effects which are described on page 25 and 26 of the rulebook. Some of them, such as the alarm, have an immediate and once-off effect. And when encountering one of these effects, after resolving it you can cover it with one of these effect resolve tokens. Some tiles, such as the Carnivorous Tunnel, will apply extra damage to players in battle. Fog or Luminescent Mushrooms can increase or decrease a player's ability to defend in combat. There are Egg Lairs, which help the Infernal player spawn new enemies. There are Tunnels, which can connect to other places in the Catacombs, and so on. I won't cover how all of these work in this video, but you can read them in the back of your rulebook. There are also some tiles which will cause a scenario specific effect as soon as it is placed, and those rules will be in your scenario booklet. Once a player has finished exploring a tile, if he or she still has movement points remaining, may continue moving and exploring other tiles if possible. Note that the catacombs must always have at least one unexplored exit. If a tile is ever drawn that closes off the catacombs, discard it and then draw another in its place. A warrior may initiate combat with an opposing warrior on the same tile, or an adjacent tile if the warrior has a ranged weapon or a ranged attack. A single combat by a human warrior can target a demon, a hellhound, or a horde of troglodytes. If more than one of those options is present, the human warrior must choose what to target. So in this case, either the Hellhound or the two Troglodytes. Note also that a tough Troglodyte is considered a separate target to a normal Troglodyte. So in this case, the player would have to choose from the three targets separately. Check the character's current line of activation to determine the attack strength. In this case, it's four. But if the character were doing a ranged attack with this weapon, it grants an additional one. So let's say this is a ranged attack, the character would have 5 strength. The attacking player rolls a number of combat dice equal to the attack strength for this particular combat. Then check the opponent's defensive strength, that's the number next to the shield. Each die which rolls a number equal to or higher than the number next to the shield scores a hit. And additionally any skulls rolled score a hit. These dice run between 1 and 5 with a skull side. When fighting against a demon or a hellhound, each hit suffered results in one damage marker, the little red skull, being placed into one of these slots. If all of the hearts are ever covered, then that demon or hellhound has been killed. Hellhounds are removed from the game entirely, while a demon has to be killed twice before it is removed from play. The first time a demon is killed, Remove it back to the Infernal player's player board, whence it can be respawned. The second time a demon is spawned and then killed, then it is removed from play entirely. The Infernal player will not be able to bring it back. Note that this is only the default rule, and a specific scenario may have different rules regarding demon respawning. When fighting a horde of normal troglodytes, 
Each hit scored in a single attack roll removes one troglodyte from the board. These go back to the infernal player's supply of troglodytes to be redeployed later. There are some talents in the game which impact combat. A frenzied warrior may re-roll once any dice that did not score a hit in combat. A bodyguard may take hits for an ally on the same tile. So if this character had landed one hit on the hellhound, the scourge could use the bodyguard power to take that hit instead to keep the hellhound alive. And a resilient warrior does not suffer the first hit dealt in combat. So while this roll would yield one hit, the resilient enemy takes no damage. After the human player has finished with activation, it becomes the infernal player's preparation phase. Here, the infernal player will be rolling three of his or her dice and then allocating them around this board in order to activate various abilities. To understand how these various powers work and how the infernal player might want to use them, it pays first to understand how the infernal player brings enemies into play and then uses them. So we're going to skip ahead from this phase for now and come back after we're finished with the threat phase and the infernal activation phase. The threat phase is where the infernal player brings new miniatures into play to attack the humans. The player may bring as many new miniatures into play provided he or she can pay the cost in Prima Matera gems. Bringing a troglodyte into play costs one gem. Bringing a hellhound into play costs three gems. Bringing a demon into play will cost five gems assuming that you're allowed to summon demons in this scenario. In some scenarios there will be specific rules which dictate how or when a demon is spawned. New infernal warriors can be brought in subject to three placement restrictions. Firstly, they must enter through an unexplored exit. Secondly, the tile they enter must contain no human warriors. And thirdly, they must meet the occupancy limit on the entry tile. So here, the only valid entry tiles are here or here because they contain open exits, but this one, which also has an open exit, has human warriors. However, if the infernal player were bringing in two new warriors, they could not both be placed here due to the placement limit of three on this tile, and so they could be brought in through different entrances. As a special rule, when the infernal player brings a hellhound into play, he or she takes one die from his or her board of destiny, usually this area, chooses any number from that die and then places it into here. This is similar to the human player choosing a line of activation for a character. And as long as this die remains here, the Hellhound will have the battle statistics that match the number. So in this case, 3 movement, 1 attack and 3 strength, as well as frenzy and elusive. The player will later be able to remove this and replace it with a rolled die, but upon placing the Hellhound does get full choice of which set of stats to use. The Infernal Activation Phase works in the same way as the Human Activation Phase. The Infernal player may activate each of his or her warriors on the board by taking a move and an action in either order. The movement and battle statistics for all of the Infernal player's warriors will be shown on the relevant character boards. Movement restrictions for Infernal warriors are the same as for Human warriors. So, Infernal Warriors are subject to the same occupancy limit as humans, and Infernal Warriors cannot leave a tile if outnumbered. The only difference is that Infernal Warriors cannot explore new tiles. In combat against multiple human warriors, the Infernal player must choose which one of the opposing warriors to attack. Then, the battle goes the same way as it did for the human player. The Infernal Warrior rolls dice equal to its attack strength, and scores one hit for each die which either meets or exceeds the opposing player's defense per the current line of activation. Remember that a skull will always score a hit. For each hit scored, the human player must take one damage marker and cancel one line of activation. It's the human player's choice which line to cancel. Remember that you can cancel the current active line of activation without becoming exhausted. 
Exhaustion occurs only if that player later chooses to go into that slot. When a human character suffers its sixth hit, the character is killed and immediately removed from the game. Now that we've seen how the Infernal player takes actions, we'll come back and look at how the Infernal player prepares for his or her turn. At the start of the preparation phase, the Infernal player will have six dice spread across his or her boards. Some will be in this location, these are available dice that have not been employed anywhere. Some will be on the top half of one of these different activation spaces. This is a die that is being banked but hasn't yet been activated. And others will be on the bottom half of these activation spaces, and these are dice whose effects have been triggered. To start the activation phase, retrieve any dice that have been triggered and put them back into your available pool. Any that have not yet been triggered, stay where they are. Then take three dice, shake them and roll them. The dice range from one to three in white and red. Note that the rolling of three dice is mandatory and if the player has so many untriggered dice that he or she has fewer than three dice available, then the player must take some of these untriggered dice and roll them so that he or she has three to roll. After rolling the three dice, the Infernal player allocates these dice into the preparation spaces on the top halves of these various action spaces, choosing which of these effects he or she is going to trigger this round or in future rounds. Any that meet the requirements to be triggered are shifted down to the triggered spaces and those effects will come into play this round. So now let's look at what these six basic effects are. Abyssal Threat is the way the Infernal player gains more Prima Matera gems. The player may place any number of dice of matching colour into that space and trigger it in order to get three gems per die. The dice must match and so the player could not put this red one with the whites in the same turn. Supernatural Speed requires two white dice of any number to activate. On the round that this is activated, all troglodytes, indicated by this icon, get an extra one movement range. Frenzied Creatures is activated by using any two red colored dice. On the round that this is activated, all troglodytes gain the Frenzied trait. This means that all troglodytes may re-roll a miss for this round only. The Dark Destiny space is how the Infernal player draws event cards. The player places any die of any colour here and then draws a number of event cards equal to the number on the die. He or she looks through those that were drawn, chooses one of his or her preference and then holds it in hand. The Infernal player may hold no more than four such cards. Each of these cards will tell you during which phase of a round it can be played. An Intrepid Charge is activated by any combination of dice which add up to seven or more. In the Threat phase, which immediately follows activating Intrepid Charge, the Infernal player can ignore the empty tile restriction for bringing warriors into play. In other words, Troglodytes, Hellhounds and Demons can all be brought into a tile which has human warriors on it, as long as there is still an unexplored exit and the player does not exceed the occupancy limit. In a similar vein, the Infernal player can do a Sneaky Charge. Sneaky Charge is activated by any combination of dice totaling eight or more, and in the threat phase which follows doing a Sneaky Charge, the Infernal player can bring warriors into play, ignoring the unexplored exit rule. And as such, Troglodytes, Hellhounds, and Demons can all come into a tile with no open exit, as long as they don't exceed the occupancy limit and there are no human warriors on the tile. So the Infernal player would always be able to bring a warrior in here, could bring one in here with an Intrepid charge, could bring one here with a Sneaky charge, but could not use either charge to come in here. If the Infernal player has a Hellhound on the board, then one of the Infernal player's dice should go into setting that Hellhound's battle statistics for the round. The player can choose not to, but in this event the Hellhound will act as if it is exhausted, unable to move or fight, and with the minimum defense. Most demons also come with a planning activation space. 
For example, the hunter with a total sum of dice of five or more, when activated, will cancel the elusive ability of any human players. The action on your demon's board is considered an extension of your main board, and you can always use this effect even if that demon is not in play or has been killed. As such, playing as the infernal player requires managing all of the dice to get these effects as best possible. The player will need to keep committing dice to the abyssal threat in order to gain enough gems to bring monsters into play and then should optimize among all of these other effects to have the best chance of fighting the humans. The game will continue until either the humans have met the objective for this scenario, or until that's no longer possible, mostly because they've been wiped out. Humans may be attempting to seek the exit, retrieve something from the catacombs, or perhaps kill a specific demon. It is worth noting as well that some scenarios have victory conditions which can see the game end in a tie. Whichever player meets his or her objective first wins the game. There are a few specific features I haven't gone through in this video, including a couple of the talents, such as Blessed and Devoted, and the effects of all the different gifts and tiles. You can find these in the back of your rulebook. Additionally, there are times where rules will contradict each other, and on page 16 of your rulebook, there's a rules priority hierarchy, which tells you which rules outrank others when there's a conflict. In particular, the specific rules relating to a scenario will always outweigh anything else. And that's how to play Claustrophobia 1643. We hope that you enjoyed this video, and we hope you enjoy playing. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know by clicking the like button, write your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Mipple University Community, to share your love for board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first notified of what's new from Meeple University, please consider subscribing to our channel. You can click on the Meeple up in the corner to do so, and do hit the bell to be notified of the new material. Until next time!